Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, I'm going to talk um, uh, uh, a little bit about uh, me, but about um, the 100,000 Genomes Project and the new genomic medicine service that's being developed uh, that has come partly out of the work of the 100,000 Genomes Project. I think Nick has sort of very clearly framed some of the stuff for me that I'm going to be talking about, which is quite lucky, which is about the infrastructure and the challenges being built. So I think it's going to be quite a different talk from what other people had, because I'm coming very much from a, a perspective of uh, what we're developing within the healthcare and with NHS. I should probably put my hand up and say I'm a, a public health consultant by background. Um, and also, within Genomics England, there were staff awards that we have each year, and I have won the one on being most optimistic. Um, which is why when Nick says people know about transformational being, change being painful, I do really know it's really, really painful, but when I talk about this, it may sound slightly easy, and it's definitely not. I've learned, because people have pulled me up on that before, to, to make it absolutely clear just how challenging bringing change across the whole NHS actually is. Um, so, as I said, first I'm going to talk about the sort of the 100,000 genomes, and I think that there are some interesting things with regard to personalised medicine within that, uh, but then into sort of where it's going with the genomic medicine service. Um, as it happens, you mentioned the Olympics, the 100,000 Genomes Project was actually a legacy of the Olympics because it came out of um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there was various horizon scanning uh, pieces of work that were done to say what should the UK be investing in over the next five years and one of the ideas that came out of that was the 100,000 Genomes Project. So, uh, uh, and then it was um, uh, announced and um, uh, we actually sort of reached the goal of sequencing 100,000 genomes in December of last year, although we've not returned results to everybody. So as far as I'm concerned, the job is, is not really done until we've done that. Um, and it really has been a coordinated response across the whole of the healthcare system. It is required uh, collaboration with different sets of people. And one of the key things is that uh, it was set up, well, I should probably say actually what it was set up to do. It was set up to do 100,000 genomes uh, through the NHS uh, in people with both rare diseases and cancer as a, a sort of a broad summary of the, the, the basic thing that it was trying to do. Um, uh, and that actually was implemented uh, uh, by genomic medicine centres that were commissioned by the NHS uh, that consisted of, well, they were virtual organisations uh, and in effect covered 85 hospital trusts across the whole of, whole of England. So it was actually, the intention was that it would always have that national coverage uh, uh, to provide equity of access to the programme. Um, also something that I also like to say is that it had a particular strand on health and education uh, and the need to upskill the workforce to do that because when you're bringing transformational change, actually driving the knowledge base is also really key and important. Um, so I thought for this talk it would actually be potentially a little bit interesting to just sort of talk about um, how using the rare disease bit practically our analysis is working to give people an idea of that because I think that that's quite important. So the sort of the patient and the family get got were, were recruited to the uh, 100,000 genomes project. Uh, they were given, uh, uh, their, their clinicians gave phenotypic data and pedigree data and that was put into a central system uh, and their uh, blood was taken and DNA extracted and, and it was sequenced. Uh, and all of that data was put into um, uh, the Genomics England sort of data infrastructure which is here. Uh, and that was put through our bioinformatics pipeline. Uh, and the bioinformatics pipeline uh, was looking for uh, sort of known findings. So where our current knowledge base was, it was trying to identify diagnoses. Um, people who were recruited to rare diseases had, um, uh, had, had to, to be recruited, had to have all the local testing that was expected in terms of their healthcare before they were recruited. So it, in essence, they were enriched as being people who would be unlikely to find a diagnosis from new knowledge. Uh, and yet actually from this process, we're still getting a sort of a, a 20 to 25% diagnosis rate. And in some areas, uh, 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 like eye disease, it's sort of up to 45%. So, so that's really exciting for the patients. But the really key bit that I wanted to draw your attention to is the bit over here in the corner. Because uh, we've talked about the need for big data and we've talked about the importance of big data uh, uh, in healthcare and precision medicine. The challenge for us is how do you actually make the most of that big data? And so the people who took part in the 100,000 
Uh, they also agreed to all of their data being put into a big research infrastructure, uh, which could people could come into and access, but they could only remove the data in aggregate form, uh, but they could do their analysis within that. And the GSIPs are the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Partnerships. Uh, and these are the academic researchers who are then doing analysis on this data. Um, but it's not just, uh, oh, and sorry, cancer whole genome analysis reports. We also did cancer. Uh, 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 again, this data is being provided for research, uh, but also in terms of the reports that are going back to people, um, uh, this included identification about whether or not they'll be eligible for trials or, or other such sort of information. Um, uh, being absolutely honest, at the start of the programme, when we were trying to get it operationally worked, the timelines for um, uh, uh, returning the results meant that the actionable aspects of these reports were probably past the point where they were relevant to people. In fact, we've had a number of cases where people have had recurrence, and this has actually only been useful, or has been useful at the point of recurrence, to identify things that might be relevant to them in terms of trials and other things. Uh, 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 but actually, by the end of the programme, we had a sort of a fast-track, clinically urgent pipeline uh, that was getting uh, results back to people for the Genomics England part of the pipeline within 20 working days, um, uh, usually shorter than that. Uh, when, when you consider how long it took to do the first human genome, you know, that's really quite incredible. Um, so this means that there's a whole opportunity and in infrastructure that becomes possible for doing more molecular-driven uh, 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 diagnosis and engagement in, in, in research opportunities. I truly believe that actually part of healthcare is now having the opportunity to be involved in research. And that's something that should be open to everybody, not just the people sort of in Oxford and Cambridge, but the people in Hull. Uh, 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 and there's quite good evidence that involvement in research leads to better outcomes full stop. Uh, and therefore, systems that allow us to do this is, is really important. And part of the shift that I think genomics needs to bring uh, uh, is, is towards driving that idea as this is a part of standard clinical practice. I should perhaps also say, given the conversations that happened earlier, I totally get that genomics isn't personalised medicine, it's only a part of it. Um, what I find interesting about genomics is that I think that it's often driving some of the conversations that relate to the other stuff, because in terms of practical implementation, it's much further ahead. And that's why I find it quite exciting, even though I must admit I'm not really a proper genomics person. Uh, but don't tell Genomics England that, because I will be in, in a lot of trouble if they ever found out. So where are we in terms of progress to date? Well, actually, I think when you bring about sort of transformational change in the NHS, one of the things that is uh, important is that to drive that change, the frontline healthcare workers have to understand that this is important for patients. Um, and there are a number of challenges in getting the, the 100,000 started. We were aiming for 100,000. Towards the end of the program, I think the idea that this was leading to real patient benefits got embedded, and so instead of collecting 100,000 samples, the NHS slightly slipped up and recruited 100,000 uh, 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 100, uh, genomes, uh, sorry, samples, which we're now still sequencing. Uh, that's, that's incredible. Uh, um, there were about um, uh, 30,000 of those that were cancer samples that were fresh frozen samples. This was engineering new pathways within the NHS to deliver these sorts of samples. And this was happening in uh, district general hospitals as well as teaching hospitals. I think there were over 400 fresh frozen pathways that were set up. Uh, and actually, the, the change that you saw within pathology as people went from this just can't happen to we know that this should happen, but we can't do it, to now actually we're beginning to see how this can work. And, and that was really great to be a part of. Um, as I said, um, uh, the really important thing is the results that are getting back, and we're starting to return those. We return on, on average reports uh, or sets of results that are then analysed by the NHS of a rate now at about 500 a week, uh, uh, whole genome analysis. Um, but I wanted to touch on really the, you know, the, the clinical and the research aspect, because as I said, in terms of thinking about where the future is, how we bring the two of these together, uh, the research and the, and the clinical, it is really going to be absolutely key. And I think not just to genomics, but the whole of personalised medicine. So the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Partnership uh, uh, is a, uh, uh, basically people join it, and in return for agreeing to work on the data, they get free access to the data. Uh, uh, and so far in the 
uh, a research database. There are over uh, 90,000 genomes. I think we, we, we include hospital episode statistics, as well as clinical data, as well as ONS data, as well as other things. Uh, and at our last data release, uh, there were 1.6 billion individual clinical data items, if you interpret that broadly, to include sort of hospital episode statistics in our data centre. That is an awful lot of data in one place for people to work to. Um, but it's not just uh, 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 academics who have access to this de-identified data, it's also uh, industry as well. So we have agreements with industry and we have the Discovery Forum uh, and they are uh, sort of starting to work and, and, and access in this. And I think, to be honest, you know, we hoped that there would be full access to this data sort of two, three years ago. Really, people have only getting access in the last year or, or six months uh, in terms of the full sets of data and people being fully onboarded. Um, but what we're already beginning to see is that actually uh, uh, diagnoses or rather clinically relevant information that should be fed back uh, uh, to the NHS is being identified by researchers who are working on this database. So this is a kind of a new model whereby actually research activity is leading to clinical insights and this is a mechanism for formally and actively feeding it back, which is, is really quite exciting. Um, I wanted to give one specific example, uh, and the interesting thing here is, this, or, well, or maybe it shouldn't be interesting, but to me it is, is that this is actually one of our commercial partners who was doing research. Uh, and um, uh, in terms of the sort of technical aspect of this, uh, our pipeline at the time when people were put through were not actually looking for CNVs, that was something that we had to develop, we've now developed it, uh, uh, but uh, uh, this company was looking in the research centre uh, uh, to identify and, and do research and identified several people whom would actually have a potential diagnosis and so that has been passed to us. Uh, and we're working with the NHS to work out what the best way is to feed back this information because it can't be just feedback fed back in a sort of uninterrupted unconscious stream, it has to be, um, uh, it has to happen in a way that doesn't overwhelm the NHS. But to sort of see that actually the research environment is actually leading to things that are being passed back directly is really exciting. And I think that there's a, a wider message for how we deal with, with big data and precision medicine and how research interacts with regard to that. Um, it's really interesting because we went out, because uh, what makes this possible is the sharing of all of the data and it being present. And we've got a national participant panel. Uh, and they, they are involved in a number of aspects. They're involved in our access review committee, so they are actively involved in who determine, in determining who gets access to the data. Uh, um, and uh, uh, they, they are very much for this sharing of data. They see the importance of it for them uh, in terms of the potential for new diagnoses. In fact, there, there was uh, one application that we had which uh, wanted to do some geospatial analysis uh, and we were very worried about this because we promised them that we would protect their identity and that's part of all of what we sort of feed back. And they kind of went, well, that's good and that's important to us because we want it to be used safely, but it's not good enough that you can't allow good research, so go away and figure out how this to be done. And I love the fact that they are the ones pushing us forward on the sharing of the data. Uh, and I think that, that it's probably, you know, I recognise, but this is important, it's because many of these are affected and lead to potential benefits uh, for themselves and their families in doing it. But also they're incredibly altruistic because they want those benefits for other people as well. Um, but we've actually sort of just engaged in a, a public dialogue and a report is going to come out of this. And actually the public in general is, is pretty much in favour at least of people being given the choice about whether or not their data should be shared. So. I, I think that the sort of 100,000 has, has really demonstrated the importance of bringing the data in a practical sense together for, for different aspects of working on. And actually the ecosystems that we think about in terms of how we, we lead to driving this forward is, is also, essentially it's a big experiment, uh, but it does seem to be working and I think that's insights for the future. Um, where are we going now? Well. The future is the NHS Genomic Medicine Service, and this is being commissioned and delivered by NHS England, not Genomics England, but Genomics England is delivering and supporting aspects of it. Um, uh, there are some key, key points about it, so it's got a national test directory, uh, uh, so this will state for which indications people should have which test types, and that includes uh, for, certain, uh, uh, for certain rare diseases, uh, there are 21 indications, including sort of intellectual disability, uh, uh, which 
uh, says whole genome sequencing should be the uh, test of choice. Uh, and also for cancer, it's got a sort of a standardised set of um, uh, testing for that. And for uh, three cancer types, sarcoma, paediatrics and uh, hemonc, uh, it is suggested that whole genome sequencing should be the test of choice for that to, to inform treatment. Um, it's working towards operating to common national standards. Um, there's some really interesting stuff about data and data sharing. So at the moment, what we're pursuing with them is a concept that actually uh, they're moving to sort of seven genomic lab hubs across the country, but that these are all part of one virtual lab. And therefore, as such, everybody and all of the data within that lab and that system, it's appropriate for people to have access within that system to that data, uh, which really makes sense, particularly in a rare disease context, because if you've got someone in Newcastle who is the expert, then you want them to have access to the data and work and interact with people in a, a different place. Uh, and to date, there have been challenges about data governance. Um, the other thing that is really important is, as was said earlier, the genome is basically uninterpretable unless you've got other genomes to compare it against. And therefore, people have to um, share their data to take part in, in having the clinical service. Um, and I think that that is really, that, you know, that's their choice about whether or not they do that, but they do have to have, um, uh, uh, they do have to choose, um, uh, sorry, they have to choose whether or not they want that in terms of the test. They have a choice about whether or not they want that data to be made available in a de-identified way for researchers. Uh, and so I think that that's really important because actually, uh, we can't offer these tests without the data being brought together. Um, the system that we're building, which is a national system, is real. It's out for beta testing with the genomic lab hubs. I've shown a picture of it because, as was discussed, building informatics systems in the NHS is challenging. Look, it's real. It's being tested. Um, we've also got the challenge in terms of the future of the announcement. So just when we did 100,000, they came along and said, we've got to do 5 million. Um, it's kind of an, an, an interesting thing for us to be working with now. I should be really specific about this, and I've got the, the numbers broken down. Uh, so that's a definite commitment to one million, uh, uh, half a million for UK Biobank, half a million for NHS clinical services, and everything else is an ambition that we have been tasked to try and achieve. So that's the bit that we have to, to, to sort of work on. But I think that the structure is there. I've realised I've talked too much, but um, in terms of very quickly, I see this as an infrastructure that allows the implementation of personalised medicine. I think that building the infrastructure will allow the research to be done that will then be able to be translated into healthcare. And for me, that's the really important bit about where the genomics is going, is that it's developing that. And just quickly skipping through some slides, because that was basically all I was going to say. My final comment is my comms team do all of the slides for me and they're desperate for followers and apparently I'm their best recruiter. So I do have a heartfelt plea to all of you to sign up and follow us uh, because it really helps me out.